Now, uh, well, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, today's uh, second speaker, Dr. Pedro Perez Neto, an old friend of mine from my days as an undergraduate and master student in Rio de Janeiro back in the 90s. Dr. Pedro Perez Neto is a full professor and the Canada Research Chair in Spatial Ecology and Biodiversity at the Department of Biology of Concordia University Concordia University, Montreal, Canada. He has a multifaceted uh, research program at the interface of community and quantitative ecology. Through most of his research uh, focus on aquatic assemblages, his work spans to terrestrial biodiversity as well. He has been developing quantitative tools and frameworks for the monitoring and management of biodiversity. He is a deputy ed editor in chief of OICUS and an associate editor of Ecography, Global Ecology and Biogeography, and Methods in Ecology and Evolution. He is the past vice president of the International Society of Biogeography and is particularly interested in interacting and mentoring the new generation of biodiversity researchers. Although Pedro's home is now Canada for 25 years, he was born and raised in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, by the Copacabana Beach. He would have loved to come personally to Natal and be able to interact with old friends and make new colleagues. He was also looking forward to seeing again the other most beautiful beaches in the world after Copacabana according to his opinion, obviously. Welcome, Pedro. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitations to be here today and give us a plenary lecture at our conference. The Thanks, word is, is your, it's all yours. <clears throat> Thanks, Kaka. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right. So I'm gonna share the screen using just the portion of a screen so that I can uh, have access to, uh, no, that's not working. Let's go just with regular sharing screen. Um, all right, okay. Oh. All right, that should work. Those are still, I had a little bit of time. Can you see my, now my screen? Not yet. No, you can't. Huh. Yes, now we can. No. Okay. Perfect. All right. All right. Is that working? Yes. Perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kaka. I was really looking forward to come down, you know, see you. We got to see you from, I almost feel that we see each other every decade. I was looking forward to Sydney as well. Kaka and I and Sydney and Renata Panoso, uh, Kaka's wife, were roommates uh, for, you know, almost a couple of years during our, at least my master's. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's always uh, great memories. Um, I was also looking forward to see Matthew <laughs> and Luke the Mister and many other friends that were attending uh, this conference. So I've, you know, uh, Matthew set a, a really tall order for me. Um, I'm not gonna do much on the quantitative side. What I'm gonna do is more on sort of ideas and speculations where I think we need to look uh, into um, uh, different aspects to better understand uh, meta communities. So one of the things, this is also borrowed from a terrestrial system uh, from Mark Valland, uh, who is a uh, forest ecologist uh, by heart. And I was always fascinated uh, to understand um, how species that may look very uh, similar sometimes phenotypically, but they're very different physiologically and in many other aspects, they actually get together and so close and, uh, and, and they coexist. 
Interesting enough, I don't come from a terrestrial environment, as you're going to see today, but I have, it's interesting, I started in streams where things are very dynamic. Then I moved to Canada. Apparently, there's no streams here, according to, <laughs> there are many, there are tons of it. I work on them, but like landscapes, aquatic landscapes in Canada are dominated by, by lakes, as, as we know, or a lot of us know. Uh, so I started working on lakes. Uh, but it's interesting that I felt that forests were not dynamic enough. And I learned that they're quite dynamic as well. So, you know, this is the early days of community college in some ways, like Matthew was saying earlier, trying to understand the environmental drivers of, um, of, of patches, right? Uh, this, this is uh, sort of the, the famous work done by Rob Whitaker, uh, who also uh, developed the five kingdom, uh, early five kingdoms that we use um, to describe our, um, our uh, diversity. Now we also have, and I'm going to try to merge a little bit here, uh, the ideas that, you know, uh, there, there is environmental drivers, but there are historical drivers as well. And biogeography, which is, has become sort of a passion of mine in the past 10 years, uh, is also uh, quite important. This is the famous photogeography done by Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, it was his 250th uh, uh, anniversary uh, last year. And he described uh, the way, you know, you have those uh, large scale discrete uh, packages of, of biotas. And the same happens obviously uh, with aquatic systems. And this is some of our work uh, based in Ontario. A lot of the work I'm gonna talk today, uh, it's gonna be Ontario. Uh, Ontario is huge. There's, you know, it can put many European countries inside of Ontario, although it sounds like a Canadian province. It's quite, quite uh, huge, as you're going to see uh, soon. And then, you know, uh, as a, I remember as an undergrad student, uh, a student, I remember uh, reading this paper from, from the 1800s, The Lake as a Microcosm uh, by uh, Steve Forbes. And one of the things he mentions, the animals of such a body of water are as a whole remarkably isolated. And we have come a long, long way to realize that they're not that isolated. I mean, uh, lakes uh, and water and body uh, waters are uh, interconnected despite of their terrestrial uh, surroundings. And uh, I think this is a great, um, a great realization. And so matter communities came, uh, I don't quite know that's, a, I, I should know actually, because Matthew and I speak a lot about this, but it seems that matter communities is a concept that really took off a lot in, uh, in aquatic systems. Uh, particularly, I think, is because aquatic bodies of water, we have this sense that they are discrete and they're patchy and we can observe them as such, whereas a forest is more continuum and we have a, maybe a harder time. And there are some discussions in community ecology today that I think from, come from this po two point of views. Some of the work that, um, some of the discussions by um, um, Bob Rickliffs in the past, trying to understand terrestrial communities as a more continuous rather than a discrete. I, I don't wanna get into that discussion today, but it relates to what Matthew was uh, relating to hope. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end. Well, obviously, this is the kind of distribution that every college start thinking. There's an environmental gradient, population density pad, and this kind of distribution would have probably put ecologists out of a job. It's too easy to explain. There's not much, uh, much going on. And we know that there is a, a full uh, uh, complement of uh, mechanisms and processes that can actually make species not look this perfect little uh, 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 Gaussian distribution here, and it, it gets a little more complex. And obviously, when you put this into uh, a more uh, meta community or a large uh, landscape, uh, things get uh, quite, quite uh, complicated. So as Matthew was saying earlier, one of the interesting parts is to understand what makes species to be positive and negative uh, uh, covary in, in landscapes. And that's something that I'm going to uh, talk about today. Uh, so this is my first aquatic system. Uh, this is the, the, the Mata Atlantica in Brazil. Uh, this is where I was born. Coco was born here, although he doesn't really come from the nice parts of Rio. He comes from a 
Cabo Frio, which is, you know, not as nice. But anyways, we love him, uh, despite of, of uh, regional differences. <laughs> That's biogeography, right? It's not your fault. Um, but th those are uh, streams that are in, in the state of Rio. And, 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 you know, it made me think that I really like this idea that aquatic systems are extremely dynamic. You can sit down and see water going up and down uh, by the hour. Uh, and is a fantastic, really interesting system. And that's where I fell in love. I also fell in love with fish. The reason I fell in love with fish, because I could see them. I worked six months trying to, uh, on green algae taxonomy, hours in a microscope, and that kind of bored me. I understand a lot of limnologists, they love uh, their, my I came back to work on zooplankton, phytoplankton later um, in my life, but my taxonomic love was always fish. Uh, as a naturalist, and <clears throat> also because it was a bit easier for me, even though tropical fish can be a pain at times. All right, then I moved to Canada. I've been in Canada for about 25 years, um, and uh, a lot of the data I'm going to present to you, uh, it comes from this Ontario Broad Lakes, um, Lake Monitoring Program. Uh, Ontario and Quebec, Quebec, Montreal, where I am, it's in the province of Quebec. We've been monitoring our lakes for almost a hundred years. And one of the reasons is fisheries. We love water, we love fishing. And, um, and so this, this is important to acknowledge that there is hundreds and hundreds of people uh, that are responsible for collecting the data you're gonna see today. There are many uh, provincial governments that are uh, there are funding agencies, there are industry that is, uh, has helped also to fund and facilitate a lot of this. And it's a mix of shallow and no shallow lakes. So, you know, just keep that in mind. And um, this is also part of our Canadian network uh, for aquatic uh, ecosystem services. All right. So this is basically the, the data set I'm going to talk to you a lot, a lot about today is about uh, 900 lakes. And those 900 lakes have been every single fish identified, body size, biomass, 100 environmental and climate variables. There's another data set. This is in the past 12 years. There's another data set that expands for 10,000 lakes. And those are another uh, bigger, but not as detailed um, data set um, that comes uh, from, the, uh, from even as early as 1920s. I think Kendra was talking about this today. I think it's very important that we uh, really acknowledge that a lot of what we're doing today in terms of landscape perspectives cannot be done uh, without uh, the integration of data, uh, the structuring of data, the sharing, the reusing of data. But I also want to remember, I develop a lot of code. I, I want to remind people that code uh, that we used to do all this analysis is also open. And that's what it facilitates a lot of the work we've been doing. We talk a lot about the data, but I think it's important to remind that hundreds and hundreds and millions of hours are put uh, in, in people's uh, time that they, they actually make their cold open. All right, so as Matthew was saying, our ability to make predictions of which species where is not very high. This, uh, some of the work we've done in uh, early, uh, well, in the 2000s, and we, we showed comparing from bacteria to fish that there's a lot of residual variation. So we were in the early days, we we're not very good. And as Matthew was saying, we would be happy explaining about 20% of the variation. There's a lot to do with sampling design. I'm not gonna talk about this today. I find sometimes it's, a, it's almost a miracle. We can explain 20% of the variation to the way we actually sample stuff. I mean, to me, this is almost like, almost a miracle in itself. And uh, lots of uh, simulations I've done in the past that I show that in fact, you know, uh, not respecting spatial temporal dynamics of communities and the way we sample, can uh, actually increase quite a lot of our ability uh, to not explain those communities. So it goes into the residuals. So, you know, usually there's, there's a nice paper by Carl Kodny, uh, our uh, Belgian, now in Canada, uh, friend. And uh, although Carl didn't use proper adjustments for predictors, but my overall feeling here is that a lot of the work, the, the thousands of papers that are being published using sort of this framework of understanding variation partitioning of the 
effects of environment and space have been around 20, 25% in any good day. So this is, um, this is sort of uh, uh, the 10,000 lake data set that uh, Matthew referred early on. Uh, we, we round to, to 10,000 just to sound it even bigger. It's about 9,870 and change, all right? But I love to say 10,000 lakes. So we explain about 20% and 80% goes in the residuals. I'm not gonna explain this today, but uh, when we actually jump on understanding the positive covariance and the negative covariances of, of the residuals, we, we get to explain another 50% and the independent becomes around 20. Uh, 4%. So there's big, uh, big opportunities here to seek out what, what is this variation. But what the point I want to make today uh, is that to seek out this variation, uh, we'll, we'll take a little more understanding of how to actually set up uh, the ways we describe environmental and spatial variation rather than using the common predictors we've been using all along. Another thing I want to bring to, you know, geneticists, they, they went through for this uh, maybe uh, past uh, realization that uh, we, we don't, you know, in the early days of genetics, everyone, a ah, small number of genes with larger effects. Now we know that the new genes, there are lots of them in quantity and they're not that huge in effect. And I think maybe as ecologists, we need to start thinking that there's small number of spatial temporal mechanisms and factors. It's not necessarily true and drivers are large in quantity and small effects. So perhaps we need to go through some of these early realizations as well. Um, so that's the kind of templates that I work. I work with physical environment in time and space, mostly in space because time is expensive. Uh, and, you know, we work a lot in species distribution, traits, dispersal. I do some work on behavior. I find that social environment can be particularly important at, uh, at the patch, at small scales, and then understanding ecosystems properties. So the hope of traits, uh, it's nice to see that there's entire hour sessions dedicated to traits, is, uh, is to, to hope towards some generality, right? We want to generalize as, as much as we can, and that's uh, kind of the hope. So we can compare, uh, uh, you know, traits of fish, regardless if they are in the, ma 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 in, 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 I think this picture is from Natal uh, or in Canadian lakes. And the idea here is that functional differences will be able to explain niche differences uh, and be related to the way the species, they kind of optimize uh, their uh, environmental uh, 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 fitness. So this, this idea is not new. Uh, Philip Prime probably in 1974 is one of the first ones that started thinking that, well, you know, abiotic environments are selecting for the kinds of traits that species uh, have. And that has, you know, motivated a lot of the work we see, particularly in, um, in uh, um, uh, plant ecology. Plants are full of uh, this sort of approaches here. And, and so this, this idea of how to connect environmental and trait variation was uh, later on called the fourth corner. Uh, and I, I like to think about the etymology of the fourth corner after Pierre Legendre uh, in 1997 ecology, who was my postdoctoral mentor. And uh, we remain very good friends. We're actually neighbors now at 10 minutes from, from each other. Did I tell this minus 28 today in Montreal? I can't feel the breeze from my windows here. It's really cold. So I keep thinking about Pierre and how things are in his place. But the idea here is that we can correlate, uh, you know, some environments will select for taller trees, uh, shorter trees, and, and so on. And so this, this is work that I've been collaborating quite a lot with a um, French friend of mine, Stéphane Ré, um, and we've been developing quite, quite a lot of quantitative uh, uh, stuff related to this problem here. And you know, I, Matthew, probably you, you got from his talk that we need more robust quantitative tools. So for instance, this is the common approach to detect, for instance, the relationship between environmental variables and body size of fish. Each of those rows here are 90 of those watersheds here in Ontario. Those colors are the discrete. Each watershed has hundreds and hundreds of lakes. And you know, the early approach would give you this sort of amount of signal in your data and using more robust approaches, you see that. 
So it's not only about data uh, and about predictors, but it's also about approaches. And as we evolve, I, I'm a little more hopeful than Matthew that next week things will not be as different. I think maybe it will take, um, uh, maybe when I retire, maybe, I don't know, uh, we'll see. Uh, no, but, but it's, uh, I feel that there's, um, there's development that comes from quantitative tools that may change the way we think about things. And this is a very important realization, right? And so that trading environment is one of the corners, what I've called the many corners of community rheumatic community ecology. This figure here comes from a paper uh, with Matthew um, um, and uh, in 2010, where we started having these discussions of how to integrate, uh, you know, biogeography, phylogeny, spatial predictors, you know, in all in one single uh, framework. Uh, and Avo Economo, by the way, who is a Montrealer, now a researcher, uh, professor in uh, Japan. And so this comes from uh, sort of a workshop that we put together a long time ago. Matthew couldn't make to, to this workshop, but those are, uh, Mark Vellon was there and others, uh, Marie-Joseph Fortin. And so this is sort of the way I think about my mother or the mother synthesis of Meta Community College where uh, Matthew discussed quite a lot, you know, you have speciation uh, and it comes from uh, a lot of the work uh, uh, from Mark Vellon and in his ways to synthesize the different processes. All right, so I want to talk to you about three short things. One is some examples of complexity. We think nature is very complex, but a lot of this complexity comes from the good interactions between uh, life history and, uh, and environmental variation. And I want to give you a few examples of that using lakes. Then talk a little bit about biodiversity mediates ecosystem functioning like fish communities, integrating the approaches I've been talking and a generalized quantitative framework for increasing our understanding of the complex patterns of biodiversity. All right, so to me, contingency, there's many, many ways to define contingencies. That's the way we, we one of the ways we define contingency in this paper here also with Matthew and Stefan Dre. Uh, you know, spatial or temporal contingencies refers to the diverse patterns of biodiversity across communities resulting, resulting from the interaction between the spatial structure of the environmental heterogeneity or biogeography, and how this spatial structure then affects processes. One of the things that we realize, matter communities are open, uh, patches are open, but one of the things that we consider very little is the way the environment itself is spatialized. They're starting to have some realizations of that, and I'll come back to this later. And the life history differences among species also affect uh, uh, this interaction. And one of the things I want to make sure is that often ecologists sometimes, speaking to ecologists, uh, there's a little bit of confusion between contingency and coincidence. This to me is a coincidence. This is Mark Cabeza, Matthew Leibold, and Pedro, here, well, I'm sorry, and myself, I'm starting to speak on the third voice, never, never good. Um, and this is, this is a coincidence. I mean, this is a Spaniard that lives now in Finland, this is a guy born in Spain, now, now in the US. This is a guy born in Brazil, living in Canada. And this is the DeLorean from uh, Back to the Future. I mean, this is a coincidence. This is not a contingency. You want, you want, we won't replicate this ever again. So I wanna make sure that we understand. Uh, uh, we, we ecologists sometimes, I'm not gonna have time to do, but we confuse often random stochastic contingence, coincidences, we need to, to get those words uh, correct in the vernacular at one point. This is a seminal paper published by Sir uh, John Lawton in Arcus 1999. That's where I was like kind of, uh, uh, you know, during my PhD times. And that's where this idea of community ecology is a mass. You know, uh, do not expect universal rules, even simple contingent to general rules to emerge if, uh, and they don't treasure them. And um, I think it's important to embrace contingency. It's embrace, uh, embrace this complexity of interactions between life history and the way uh, organisms are with their environments. Uh, and so, uh, and also uh, the fact that today I get to, um, uh, to work with Lycus. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity, really. This uh, comes from that work that I was mentioning with Matthew, where um, here the biogeogra biogeographic history and meta community pro processes jointly regulate community structure in, in, those, uh, in those lakes, the spawns, and suggests um, 
that, for instance, here we have the Daphnides are more, they, they're, they move much better. They're not as dispersed restrained as calamoids. And so we find uh, that uh, in fact, they, they are better predicted by the environment they are in calanoids. Whereas calanoids, where are more sessile organisms, they are better predicted by um, biogeography. But by consider not considering these differences in clades and life history and the way they interact with their communities, maybe we would have not gotten any signal at the end. And this is an important realization is that just to throw you know, your entire data not considering life history and aspects of evolution and biogeography may actually lower the signal we have because we're mixing different contingency, different stories. And that's a very important realization, I think, in this paper uh, with Matthew. Uh, that was our first collaboration uh, in, on paper. And uh, I'm very fond of this paper. Uh, also, it took hundreds of hours of work. So <laughs> still remember those days. Uh, this is work with Bernadette Pinellalou uh, uh, and our, um, our student, uh, PhD student Renato Enrique Silva. And here's another form of contingency here. So cladorisins, uh, which are good dispersers, and copepods, which are sexual and poor dispersers, they, they, they show completely different uh, um, latitudinal patterns. So for instance, uh, in here, um, cladors cladorisins, uh, um, they, they, they have no whatsoever patterns in richness uh, across latitude um, and where uh, copepods, they do. And cladarsians, they, they increase their geographical range with latitude, which is known as the Rappaport rule, uh, whereas uh, copepods, they don't. So as we can see here, uh, there's very different uh, biogeographical patterns uh, related to those. And if we had to put those two groups together, we wouldn't probably get any signal. So contingencies are not coincidence. And I think the grandiose manifestation, and I like the title of this paper because it puts everything into one place. You know, climate history and life history uh, strategies interact and in explaining uh, different uh, macroecological patterns in freshwaters or plankton. And I feel that that's where, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to look more into this. This is another manifestation of contingency. Um, where, <clears throat> uh, where different, uh, so those, those are the same province, uh, the same uh, watersheds I showed to you earlier. And here we, uh, we can see that actually uh, different patterns of distribution. So those watersheds here, the lakes tend to be more nested in the Northwest of Ontario and Southern Eastern, they tend to be a mix of uh, nested and clemencian. And um, this is also work done with uh, Renato and who is uh, actually um, another contingency here. He is born in France, but, um, but uh, uh, raised uh, in Brazil. Uh, his, uh, his father was Brazilian, his mom uh, is French. And, and so, you know, full of contingencies. Uh, Enzo Lindo, uh, now professor at Western. But the part, important point here is that it seems uh, that uh, the history uh, glaciation and movement history of fish throughout the territory and environmental differences dictate themselves the kinds of uh, uh, structures you get. Uh, so that's very important. All right, I'm here. My video just disappeared for some reason. I'm sorry about that. All right, this is another uh, form of contingency that's gonna come back uh, later is that this is the distribution of types of, con of continuous climates on the planet. And so we determined that some climates are very common where some climates are not common uh, whatsoever. And we're trying to think how this can affect, for instance, um, aspects of, of uh, biodiversity uh, uh, um, and for instance, in here, we, we put a narrative and please read the paper if, you, if you're interested where functional diversity and climatic frequency are negative correlated. So you have more, func greater functional diversity in rare climates. 
And one of the ideas here is that rare climates are more, uh, they're less common. So there's less opportunities, evolutionary and ecological opportunities to adapt to those climates. And you're gonna have a mix of uh, generalists and specialists because they are gonna have lower uh, competitive abilities on those, clim uh, on those types of rare climates, whereas more common climates are gonna dom be dominated by specialists and therefore you increase functional diversity. And so this goes back to the story I was trying to tell you earlier that considering uh, different types of predictors and how they relate to mechanisms and processes in, in meta communities, it's also important. So it's, it's about quantitative development, but it's also about thinking about those predictors uh, themselves. So here are back to the Ontario Lakes. And so, this is a conversation I was having with Matthew last week, and I was trying to think, what, what is the relationship between spatial isolation and environmental frequency? So as you can see here, lakes that are more spatially isolated, they are also less environmentally frequent. And this is gonna have effects on the matter community uh, assembly of, of those lakes. So here, for instance, we see compositional rarity so each of those are one of those uh, hundreds of lakes here. And this is a metric that tells you how unusual, right, is to have this compositional uh, composition of species. This is also known as the contributions to better diversity. But we see that uh, compositional um, rarity is related to environmental isolation. So as lakes get more environmentally isolated, they're not capable to host uh, a, a range of species and they, uh, they become more, uh, more rare. And so uh, this could, could perhaps also be thought as ways to integrate better the internal, uh, um, internal uh, descriptors of matter communities as Matthew was talking earlier, uh, is that uh, the fact that perhaps variations as such cannot be easily described by environment or spatial correlation or co-distribution. Sometimes we need to incorporate more uh, uh, better design predictors of meta community assemblies, such as environmental isolation. Uh, I'm just saying environmental isolation, there's a lot of stats that go uh, in the back of, of, of this calculation here. All right, so let me move on to biodiversity mediates ecosystems functioning lake uh, fish communities and trying to integrate this. This work done by uh, Ignacia Ranz, who also worked with Thomas Manor uh, and, uh, and others. Uh, Nigel and Brian are uh, two research scientists from the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. So one of the things that's interesting about this data set is that allows us, uh, and it's a work that uh, Thomas Manor has uh, done a lot of uh, interesting and great work in this area, is that um, we can think about uh, biomass and body size uh, sort of um, um, slopes and the way they relate to ecosystem functioning. So as the slopes become uh, steeper, uh, there's more loss of biomass across different body sizes. And as they become more shallower, uh, there is greater uh, bio biomass conservation. And so we, one of the things we're interested in, so those are the slopes we're calling biomass conservation, the ability of those lakes to conserve biomass through trophic interactions. And one of the things we find is that uh, this is environmental isolation. Right? And so there's a negative relationship between the two. So lakes that tend to be uh, more rare in their environments and more isolated, uh, they tend, uh, maybe it's because the species that are were put together there, they're quite random in many ways and they don't optimize uh, their trophic uh, interactions in a way that allows them uh, to actually conserve more biodiversity. So they're made probably of more random species. And here we see biomass conservation and compositional rarity. So indeed, more rare communities, they're not as common. Maybe those are the, the ones that for thousands of years, those lakes are about 10, seven to 10,000 years uh, old uh, from glaciation. Maybe in those uh, 10,000 years, those uh, lake communities had uh, uh, a lot of opportunities to interact, but the ones that are rare in terms of species composition maybe they lead uh, to lower biomass conservation just because they are likely uh, more random uh, um, uh, communities. 
And last, this is the, the piece de résistance, as we would say in French, the, the main meal, I guess, uh, main part of, main course of the meal. And so I'm gonna talk a, a little bit of my thoughts of how to go bigger uh, in terms of models to understand meta communities. So one of the things I hinted earlier is this idea that environmental variation mediates uh, coexistence and, and then patterns of biomass or biodiversity uh, in general. So, uh, you know, coexistence is not in a vacuum, they occur, in environmental variation uh, has a big effect on this as we're gonna talk soon. So there are two conflicting, and I like to say conflicting just not because people are disagreeing, but conflicting in the sense that they, they go in different directions in terms of uh, determining species coexistence. So at one hand, you have forces that put species very similar to each other uh, into the same communities, same lakes, call this the locally optimal trade strategy, uh, the idea that environment is driving uh, species that are very similar in terms of traits. But then you have another mechanism, which is the local niche differentiation strategy, in which we show that there is a lot of uh, very different species, like the trees I showed you in the beginning, in the second slide of the talk, that they are able to coexist. So you have those two uh, contrasting uh, 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 sort of uh, forces. So this is a good example of the first one, uh, the local optimal trade strategy, um, where above ground biomass uh, in plants correlates uh, or is associated or predicted by community weighted mean of phosphorus concentration in young leaves. Uh, I know it's a shallow meeting, a shallow lake meeting, but uh, I'm bringing some tree examples here because this is really work that has been developed a lot in, uh, in tree ecology. Okay, so um, just checking time here. Okay, all good. Uh, so this is the another example of local niche differential strategy. This is the work by Mark Kadot, uh, where, you know, uh, and this, this is well known that average productivity tends to increase as no number of functional groups uh, they increase. So you have those two forces here uh, that can act in a contingent way. Some, some communities could be more uh, locally optimal trade strategy and other lakes could be more niche differentiation strategy and environment. That's my point I wanna make here is that environment may be uh, the, the, uh, the factor that determines which one is stronger than the other. So this would be the locally optimal strategy where, or environmental filtering or Mark Vallon uh, calling often as environmental selection. You have environment, for instance, that can affect biomass or biodiversity patterns. And then you have community uh, weighted uh, means, which just mean trait values, the average of all fish or all zooplankton and so on. Lots of work coming, by the way, on trade ecology uh, in zooplankton in the past decade. Uh, so it's interesting to see that. And this is the local strategy, which environment affects functional uh, diversity then affects biomass or more directly. Well, if you mix, you have thousands of lakes. If you mix those two types of lakes in the same analysis, you ought not sometimes to get a very strong uh, pattern. So the idea here uh, that I'm trying to bring here is that environment may mediate this, uh, the two strategies differently than they have different effects on biomass and so on. So the idea here is that to uh, consider that environment here is maybe uh, the way uh, local optimal strategies and niche differentiation are, are contingent. They are interacting with the environment. So I'm rewriting this title here that we had in 2012 and thinking about assess the effects of spatial contingency and environmental selection on uh, trait variation. And so the idea here is that, you know, in some places, uh, let's say this is biomass, in some places uh, is the average of the trait of the species that are gonna make biomass increase. And the variance is very similar into those two uh, uh, sets of, uh, let's, let's think of those of hundreds of lakes here, hundreds of lakes here. And so there's no variation in trait variance that relates to biomass, just the mean. Whereas the other pattern would be this one, whereas their mean is not important to biomass. The mean of the average fish, uh, traits of fish would not be important for our biomass. 
always the variance is the functional diversity that is important for biomass. In this particular case, increase, you can see that the variance of traits in those different lakes here is bigger and here is smaller and is driving biomass. So the idea is that, and that's the quantitative tool I wanna to talk to you a little bit to finalize my talk, is that we can you know, dissect these things further to understand biomass and biodiversity uh, patterns, understanding what are the average effects, which types of environments and functional traits and so on. So there's uh, Matthew talked about J, uh, joint species distribution models. This is a latent approach. Uh, there's lots of latent approaches in ecology. It's becoming bigger and bigger. This is my own version uh, with uh, Stefan Dre and Kyle Terbrack. Kyle uh, became a very uh, good collaborator in a lot of the work we've been doing in the past five, six years. He's well known for having developing canonical correspondence analysis. And, uh, but there's lots of versions of this. And so I understand why we're gonna continue evolving in this. But they, my basic, my version of this model is that from my species distribution data, we can extract uh, environmental uh, latent gradients and trait uh, gradients as well. And then from those, you solve this problem here of uh, the corners, and then you have correlations of latent traits and latent environments, and you can solve this, uh, this uh, structure equation model here uh, in a way. And so I'm not gonna put a lot of math. There's lots of equations here to get to this point, uh, but basically you can, uh, you can partition the latent variation in traits uh, into among communities, which is the community way to trait mean, and the within uh, community variation, which relates to functional trait diversity. And then this latent here on the, uh, it becomes the environment. So the idea of latency is how much we can uh, get going with this. It's not per se describing the traits or the environment, but what is interesting is how much we, we can actually uh, uh, describe and if it's with if it's worth and if you get to explain 80 or 85 or 60 or whatever percentage is worth then investing in that system to undercover actually the traits uh, and environmental variables which often are uh, very uh, laborious and so this is an approach we push here uh, in which we describe in fact how much is worth and so we show that some watersheds uh, this component is much higher than this component so it's interesting to, to, and some are bigger this component than that component. So it's interesting to think about the traits and the environmental variables that could be driving that. And I'm just talking here about the trade environmental correlation. Again, there's many other things that we could incorporate in this uh, bigger uh, uh, um, uh, quantitative framework. And I keep saying, we're not looking into enough corners. Uh, we need to do more of, uh, of that. So here is the total lake biomass, which is an important, uh, you know, ecosystem uh, functioning and services, uh, especially uh, in many lakes in Canada. Uh, well, in all lakes in Canada this is very important, but for communities as well. And so this is the predicted by this component here, right? So we explain if we're partitioning all this, about 23% of the variation, this is 12% of the variation, the function of diversity. Then the environment, the latent environment is about 32%. But when incorporate this total model here is explaining about 73% of the variation in biomass. I could have pushed a little more, uh, but you know, I didn't integrate so many nonlinear. Here is all a pure linear model. So uh, there, there are some nonlinear, uh, for instance, here as well. And as we can see, the latent functional diversity uh, uh, relates negatively to the environmental frequency, which is the prediction we had for uh, the trees as well in uh, North America in our earlier paper. So as, the, as more rare environments, they tend to, uh, uh, sorry, more common environment, uh, sorry, uh, more rare environments increase functional diversity, okay? Uh, again, linear fits is not the best, but dem demonstrate the point that goes in negative the way we expected. And we ac actually have a, a, a model that, uh, um, mechanistic models that explain why this prediction uh, works this way. So models will need to go bigger. That's the point I'm trying to, uh, you know, the help will come eventually when we integrate all this sort of corners 
into mean and variance uh, decompos uh, mean components and variance components. Even environments itself, sometimes you could be in the same community and you have species in that community that actually their optima for environments are very different. So you have some sort of a functional diversity there, but in terms of environment. And, you know, some ways to rethink meta communities. Uh, Matthew was talking earlier, some ideas that we're having about this is to maybe, you know, uh, estimate all this huge uh, set of parameters and trying to describe different meta communities uh, according to those parameters. Okay, so lots of parameters need to be estimated. There's a lot of work to be done here. And this is an important point that I want to make again. Again, we need predictors that sometimes it makes it uh, more straightforward, the links between the mechanisms and with the processes of assembly of matter communities. Uh, this is work that is helping us to describe a lot of the traits in fish in Canada that will be helpful into actually supplementing those uh, latents. So this is dead gen fish, which is a, uh, which is a, a eDNA, uh, uh, network for Canada uh, that we are being able to describe a lot of, uh, and we, we will be able to further describe biogeography, uh, local adaptation, and so forth that we can bring to the table. So some of final thoughts, think as contingencies as interesting and complex interactions between environment and biology, for instance, life history. So don't think of them as coincidence or things that are too ugly and too complex. I think we can spend time dissecting those things if we spend studying enough time our organisms. So, you know, we're ecologists, but we also are biologists in many, in many cases. Need to incorporate predictors of biodiversity and ecosystem services that link better mechanisms to processes. Perhaps we need bigger models. And this is only possible when we have all this data and code integration. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, this, uh, this screen for now. All right. And I'm done. Thank you very much, Pedro, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here in this meeting. I was supposed to not be uh, here in Brazil, but uh, it would be nice right. to see you again. But well, that's what we have for today. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, uh, uh, I would like to ask you guys if you have questions to Pedro to write write them in the question and answer option of, of Zoom. I will start with uh, the first question uh, from uh, Nestor, the Sara Institute in Uruguay. Pedro, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. According to the Clementian perspective, Groups of species occur more frequently due to their functional complementation. Some of these interactions are known and others are not. The Clementian perspective is a suitable framework, but it seems to work better in conditions of greater stability of the environment in terms of current variability as in the biogeographic trajectory. What do you think about it? Yeah, it's very interesting what you're saying. So one of the things we, we also know is maybe Clementian, particularly in those lakes, because those lakes, some of them we don't consider they're still in equilibrium. So as you go north, right, uh, glaciation, uh, those lakes are younger in some ways. So we, we find the same. Uh, there is uh, the work that we've done um, uh, with uh, Renato, this paper in ecology uh, that describes, it's called a community of matter communities. We, we demonstrate that indeed that's true. Uh, 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 Clementsian are related to, to older uh, lakes in the sense that perhaps species have more time to sort according to gradients. They also relate to more longer gradients. So actually species can find perhaps the environment in those watersheds. So that's also another form, and I'm agreeing with you, uh, Clementian uh, tend to be more related to more uh, um, sort of spatially stable, spatially predicted, predictable uh, uh, environments. Uh, and, and so, but that's a form of contingency in itself, right? So it would be very interesting, for instance, if we have the thousands and thousands and thousands of meta communities, 
started doing meta uh, analytical work to determine what kinds of environments will lead to the kinds of species distributions that we have. And I think we should go in that way. But uh, yes, absolutely. I think you were uh, spot on on that. Okay, here a question from Renata Panosso. Do you know her? Hey, Renata. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hi, Pedro. Good to I see think you. I know her before you knew her, my friend. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, uh, I think I do. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's true. Uh, good to see you. Which who is uh, Renata's wife, by the way, for those that don't know. Good to see you. Thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Could you explain what do you mean by isolated lakes? What would be the minimum distance between an isolated lake from other lakes? Okay, thanks Renata. So there are two types of, um, and I went very quick on this. So spatial isolation is a big uh, complex uh, question. I only used uh, here uh, Euclidean distance, just geographical distance, right? So for instance, we've done detailed work for 300 lakes out of those. It took almost six months to actually determine all the watershed paths, the hydrology, and so on. That's a lot of detail work to get, what, 7 8% more variation explanation? Maybe, but it's a lot of work uh, that has to be done. So this is the simplest form, the geographical uh, isolation. The other one, which I'm calling the, the spatial environmental isolation. So for instance, a lake could be very distant from another lake, but the environment be very similar to those lakes. So this is going to generate some kind of dynamics. In other cases, you could have a lake that is very close to other lakes. And some of the maps I was showing this, but is environmentally very distinct. So there's a almost a, a reconciliation. We call this in, in, in follow biogeography, this reconciliation of, of uh, two informations. One with distance in space, the organ is going to have to go. But once they get there, maybe the environment is very similar. And we don't understand. Um, in fact, I had a, uh, a student that just finished uh, trying to get this into using more mechanistic models. We have very poor understanding of how spatial and isolation, geographic and environmental isolation, uh, they play together in determining meta community dynamics. And I think that's the place we have to look more as well, because even in island biogeography that we assume equilibrium all the time, uh, we finished some work uh, showing that, in fact, a lot of uh, island archipelagos and lakes are in disequilibrium because closer lakes sometimes are often, right, smaller maybe, are often very close to another lake that is very similar environmentally, but sometimes very distant. And this generates all kinds of interesting matter community dynamics that we haven't explored yet how it does. But yes, very poor spatial predictors. Thanks, Renata. I would have loved to see you. Okay, here comes a, a question from your friend, Luke De Mester. Hi, Pedro. Thanks for the great talk. You too, Matthew. In your vision that more corners need to be looked at, I would agree. But I wonder whether the order in which one focuses on these different additional variables plays a big role. If simple, a of environment and S of species are wrongly estimated because, for example, not entirely linear. Is there a risk that they will be picked up in the latent variables? And if so, how to deal with that? Yeah, that's a hi, Luke. Uh, again, would have loved to see you. At least you were the last, last one that I saw in person. So uh, um, this is a really, you know, <laughs> this is a big question. Um, the short answer is that I have to think uh, a lot uh, about how the latents would actually consider that. But the order in latents would be tricky to actually, I, I feel that sometimes the order, uh, particularly in, if you think about structure equations, right? You have hypotheses that will drive the orders of those things. So obviously we know uh, that um, depending on the order that you put, the latents may be helpful there, but not as much as if you truly have uh, the environmental uh, variables because you know the way pH works might be different from temperature and, and so on. But what my, my feeling here is that this kind of structure equation models integrated with latents are to me uh, 
So structure equation people in economics and ecology, particularly in plant systems, they use latents a lot. And I think the joint species distribution models haven't gone there yet, but I feel that, um, I feel the problem is some systems, we won't be able to test those high. Uh, Pedro, you get, uh, you get moot. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, sorry. It's a problem of identifiability. So in some systems, you may be able to actually separate what environment from biogeography and so on. But in some systems, you may not because that system doesn't offer ways for us to dissect that variation. It's like, you know, nature never provides the perfect experimental design, but something along this way. We need more beer for this, Luke. Uh, okay, now a question from Libin Zhu. Thanks, Pedro, for your nice talk. I have a small question. How do you define the environmental reality? What kind of quantized index? Yeah, so there are many ways to quantify this. The easiest way, uh, and which relates also to uh, other statistical properties, for instance, pick all your lakes or whatever patches you have, Calculate a, a pairwise Euclidean distance. Say you have 700 lakes, you have 700 by 700, and you calculate the distance they have environmentally, maybe taking into account nonlinearities and stuff. And for each lake, you calculate the average of the distances of that lake to the other lakes. So if the average is very high, it means that that's, that particular lake is very different from the others. And so it is environmentally rare. If your distance is very small, it means that that lake has an average composition of environments that is very similar and it becomes less rare. But there are many other ways. Uh, in, the, in the paper for the, for the global climate, we use a more sophisticated nonlinear approach used based on kernels. Uh, so there are different approaches that you can think. But in essence, the, the intuition is the one that I explained about the distance. However, later on, how you adjust these things, uh, it, it gets complicated. If you're more interested, just write me an email. We can talk some more about it. Uh, all right, a question from Stefano Zosal. Hi, Pedro, thanks for the presentation. How we can incorporate environment, environmental micro variations in traits analysis to explain rich communities such as phytoplankton? Oh, that's a great, fantastic question. And, you know, uh, I've been working for many, many years in terms of microhabitat variation in fish and phenotypes. And we know it's quite important. We, we know local adaptation is quite important. Uh, I suspect that for, for my early days in my bachelor's 30 years ago working on phytoplankton, we also know that, that it's quite, quite important. Uh, the, the bigger question Web, is that we, 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 we don't st still know quite a lot uh, uh, how to, um, to do all that detail work, right? So you could actually, and we know this, that um, lakes that have more microhabitats, they can have greater functional diversity uh, just because of that. Lakes that are bigger, uh, for instance, tend to, be, to have more species and also because uh, they have more microhabitats. So yes, that is, a, that is a great question. A lot of people, for instance, today in plants, been talking about um, uh, traits uh, that are not average, that are at the population level. But we also need this more descriptors uh, for. And one of the nicest part of all the quantitative uh, work that I showed to you today is that it's very easy to incorporate all that microhabitat variation, uh, if one has it. Uh, so um, again, write me an email if you have more questions. I know we're kind of, uh, but yes, it's very important. I know that. Uh, my feeling is that we need to incorporate more and there are ways to do. All right, here comes a question from a good old friend of you, Sidney Magela Tomas. Hey, Ney. Hi, Pedro. Thanks for this great talk. In short, our communities are mass, taking Lawton's words, or 
we could accept that this is just the nature of the beast, taking Simbelov's point of view? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So my point of view is that until we don't look into enough corners, my wish is the following, is that we have about two or 300 types of contingencies that we can classify them and it makes the thing interesting. Once we have two, 3,000, you know, I'm just putting numbers, right? But you can see where I'm going with this. If we only have one or two types of communities, I mean, if everything was perfect, uh, we wouldn't be here. And, and so biology and ecology wouldn't be so interesting. Uh, but I think what we need now is to start classifying uh, better our, our uh, communities in the sense of contingencies uh, when it works this way and try to validate more. One of the things that we don't do enough is that we learn lots from say the South or the North, but we don't use that knowledge to validate our models and to make predictions in traits or, um, or other types of things. One of the things I didn't talk today is that uh, species have traits, but you know, environments can be fought as landscape traits. And there are ways to actually uh, combine for instance, of course, temperature in the north is very different from temperature in the south, but we could generate the scriptures that are universal, right, between the two that are scalable. And I don't think we have done that enough. So I think that's where we have to go more. Um, but I really hope it's not that of a mess. I asked actually John, uh, John Lawton, to write a, a last uh, uh, view from the park for I because it was just published a couple of years ago. And um, we got to talk a little more by mail. He thinks that that was taken uh, stronger <laughs> than he wanted it. <laughs> Community college is a mess. Sometimes we say these things just to grab the attention of people. Uh, but yes, there's a lot of um, contingency, but not coincidence. And I think this is a key term here. Thanks, Ney. I would have loved to, you know, to see you. All right, uh, now uh, a question from Stephen D, I guess uh, Stephen de Klerk. Uh, yes. Hi, Pedro, uh, very interesting talk. Given the accumulating evidence that populations are able to adapt rapidly genetically, does that also need to be taken into, into account? How would the best way to do that? Yes, that's a huge, huge, huge question. Thanks, Steve. Would have also be nice to see you. Um, I guess I have too many thoughts on this, but you're correct. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, and in the, in the network that we have on the genomic uh, fish network we have in Canada, one of the things we're developing is uh, technology to actually, to understand uh, uh, fitness of local uh, populations. So hopefully we're gonna know if it makes a difference or not. I think the first thing, it, it should make a difference, right? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, conceptual and also uh, mechanistic and simulating models that shows uh, to us that this, these things are important. Uh, look, the mister has shown this empirically uh, in many cases and you as well. Uh, and so how to incorporate this? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I have some thoughts, but um, you know, I, th I think at one point we're going to start thinking more as uh, local phenotypes than species, or maybe you're going to think about more genotypes than species. You know, in bacteria, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Maybe we're going to have to think more about our species in different ways and classify them. But as you put species more and more and more and more into local, then we lose our ability to actually make predictions that are more global. So I think that's where we're going to have uh, some issues. I think we're done, right? All right, no one, just final question from my, my colleague and friend, Ali Guerre. Thanks for the great talk. When you said that most lakes in Canada are relatively young, I was curious. How is lake age related to meta-community dynamics? Yeah, so in that paper we have, there's others too, other groups that have shown this. So the last glaciation, right, uh, where the ice sheets start receding in Canada is about between seven and 10,000 years, right? And we have a good knowledge of the refugia for fish and zooplankton as well. Uh, the work uh, that we've done with Bernadette uh, Pinella-Loup uh, 
has some of uh, that stories about uh, some of the re refugia that relates to biogeography. So we know that. So we know that uh, the older lakes are the ones that are closer uh, to the south, right? Closer to the US. And because they were, um, they defrosted uh, earlier and fish started invading, right? Uh, and, and so communities had more time, right? Often one of the questions uh, to actually sort themselves out, then you go to the north. Uh, so age explains, so the nested communities that we get in the north, for instance, they are younger lakes compared to the Clements and that we get into the south. But the landscape structure between the two are very different. So that goes back sometimes uh, a little bit to look, uh, looks uh, the mystery question how you can separate. So it's very hard sometimes to separate lake age if the landscape structure is also very different of lakes that have very different uh, uh, ages. So it becomes, it, becomes, uh, it becomes tricky because that landscape may not allow us to actually test some of this. But we know that lake age relates to uh, meta community uh, for that. Obviously we want everything in equilibrium that we can make uh, predictions, but a lot of us don't believe that the Canadian lakes in the very north are still in equilibrium, meaning all the fish that could be there, it's still not there. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro, for such a wonderful talk and exciting discussions.